Welcome everyone here to the webinar of the advanced projects on ATMP manufacturing, um, which will be held today um, with experts here in the context of ATMPs. This session will be recorded. And if you have questions during this session, you can type them into the question box, which is also provided here in this Zoom meeting. And a follow-up of the questions will also be made after the session. But there is also a Q&A organized right after the talks of the two um, panelists. So this uh, session um, is part of the advanced ATMP training program, which is actually a program which is funded by the European Commission Erasmus Plus program. This is an innovative and focused learning program uh, for future developers of advanced therapy medicinal products that consists of several e-learning modules, um, webinars, but also face-to-face uh, -face workshops for these um, professionals, which are organized for PhD students, uh, postdocs, and doctors in training. This session is part of the webinar series, and the advanced program is um, a consortium, consists of a consortium of different partners, namely IATRI, I3H, the University of um, Ljubljana, um, Elevate the Instituto uh, of the Santino and Takis and KU Leuven University. I welcome for this webinar Professor Rick Geisbers from the University of Leuven, um, Molecular Biology and Gene Therapy, and also Dr. Jan Schroten, who is CEO, co founder of Antleron in Belgium. Our first speaker will be Professor Rick Geisbers. And Rick Geisbers is trained as a bioscience engineer in cell and gene technology um, and associated professor at the Faculty of Medicine at the KU Leuven and PI of the Laboratory of Molecular Virology and Gene Therapy. Um, Rick Geisbers is also, uh, his research focuses on engineering gene therapeutic approaches using viral vector technology and employing these tools for targeted identification and validation of rare genetic disorders, as well as technology development to improve viral vector purification and production. Dr. Jan Schroten is the CEO and co-founder of Antleron in Belgium. Um, which is an R&D company on a mission to enable personalized manufacturing of advanced therapies. And Antleron integrates these innovative technologies like I3, uh, 3D printing with engineered cell production processes in bioreactors and also digital process control and optimization into factor of the future of cell therapy, vaccine and tissue manufacturing. He's also board member of Flanders Bio and Medvia. I am very happy to give you now the word to, uh, to Professor Rick Geisbers, who will share with you um, his view on ATMP manufacturing. Thank you, Isabel, for this introduction. I hope the screen is fine and everybody can see the first slide. Yeah. Um, in the next 20 minutes or so, I will try to fill you in on um, uh, the advanced scientific webinar on ATMP manufacturing with a particular focus on gene therapy and viral vectors or how we can re-engineer viruses to treat genetic disorders. Now, what are ATMPs actually? ATMP stands for Advanced Therapy Medicinal Products, which are medicines uh, that are used for human use based on genes, tissues or cells. We can classify these, and they're also classified according to the EMA, the European Medicine Agencies, into three main types, gene therapy medicines, somatic cell therapy medicines, and tissue engineered medicines. Today, um, I will focus on the gene therapy medicines, um, where genetic information that leads to, where it's uh, genetic information that is being transferred to cells or tissues uh, of patients with uh, a therapeutic, a prophylactic or a diagnostic uh, aim. In general, it's very important to realize that AMP, ATMPs are quite novel in the our armamentarium um, to tackle disease, and they mainly will target disease that currently are lacking therapy or have been lacking therapy, or diseases that were treatable and have been treated, but where the treatment is very complex and or unsatisfactory. Now, 
Today, um, I will focus on the toolbox. It's like, what are gene therapy medicines and how do we generate them? How do we produce them? But actually, this is a story of people. And what you see here are several people that um, and, and their diseases that have been treated by gene therapeutic approaches in the last three to four decades. After this uh, webinar, uh, I hope you all realize that ATMPs and cell and gene therapy is actually no longer science fiction, but is actually a clinical reality. And this is exemplified um, already by uh, this figure. Um, so in Q3 of uh, 2021, the American Society for Gene and Cell Therapy, together with Pharma Intelligence, did a, a report on the status of the field of cell and gene therapy. And here you see the number, like in this uh, cake diagram, um, the number of gene therapies currently ongoing um, are about 1,900. Uh, cell therapies, about 800. And RNA-based therapies, uh, close to 700. And that was in 2021. And what is more is that from these clinical trials that are all ongoing, we currently have 19 gene therapies um, that are in the clinic, 15 RNA-based therapies and uh, 54 cell therapies, which shows you that this field is um, getting uh, traction and is evolving quite fast and will be evolving very fast in the next few uh, years and decades. Here. I give you a short list of uh, several gene therapies that are currently available um, on the market um, in Europe and in the US. And what, what is very important is the middle uh, column to me. And what you see there is the type of therapy. So you see, we, we can discern in, in the gene therapy uh, landscape, in vivo and ex vivo gene therapies. And then these are uh, using AAV, gamma retrovirus or lentivirus vectors. And I will try to explain you in more detail in the next slides what these things actually all mean. Now, how can we make gene therapy work? We actually uh, need three critical elements um, and, and we have to master these three elements in order to design a good gene therapeutic approach. The first, um, it, it might look trivial, but it's, it's something that has been lacking um, for the last part um, of the last 70 years, is a near perfect knowledge of the genetic disorder. And we refer to this uh, field of research, molecular medicine, where we try to understand the molecular mechanism of the disease. And if this molecular um, uh, mechanism underlies a genetic cause, then we can also try to tackle it using gene therapy. Secondly, we need to know what cells or what kind of tissue we have to target with the new genetic information. And we have to understand target cell biology. And thirdly, we have to devise a way, we have to, to choose a way to deliver the genetic information. Yeah, and the best matching gene delivery technology to reach the right cells at the right time in the right tissue. And when all these three um, critical elements come together, we uh, can try and develop a gene therapeutic approach. So in the end, it boils down to defining a package, which is the first thing we have to do. What kind of genetic info do we want to transfer? Secondly, we have to devise a delivery route. How do we reach the target tissue or cell? And thirdly, we have to devise um, a vehicle, a vector, um, so to say, to transfer the genetic information. Now, maybe to clarify first, what do we understand um, uh, as a genetic disease? And this is part of understanding the problem. Now, in a healthy person, we have chromosomes. Chromosomes carry different kind of genes. And as indicated here, when there is at least one functional gene, this gene will give rise to RNA. RNA will be transcribed into proteins or enzymes. And these proteins will exert what we consider a normal function, which will result in a normal function of the cell and the tissue and health for the patient. Now, for patients with genetic disorders, not all these genes that they carry on their genomes will be uh, correct. Either they lack a functional gene due to a deletion uh, or a mutation, and this will result in possible problems at a protein level. 
either there is not sufficient protein available or there is no protein available at all, or the protein does it, that is available carries um, a mutation. This results in a function that is not normal, which will result in disease. And it's this what we will aim um, to correct using uh, gene therapeutic approaches. Now, how can we make gene therapy work? First of all, we have to design our package, our genetic information. What kind of genetic information do we want to deliver um, to our cells? Now, in gene therapy, we do not use drugs or surgery, but instead we try to introduce genetic material into the cells of the patient to treat, maybe halt a disease, and in some uh, rare cases uh, to cure uh, a disorder. There are different uh, approaches that we can use. We can either use gene replacement, where we replace the disease causing mutated copy of a gene with a healthy one. We can um, have gene addition, where we introduce a new gene, a correct copy of the gene uh, in the cells of the body. We can use gene silencing in the case that we want to reduce uh, the expression of a mutated gene, or we can use gene editing approaches where we try to erase, knock out, for example, or rewrite um, a malfunctioning gene copy. Now, this genetic information we have to transfer, and now we have to define a route. There are two different routes that we can devise. On the one hand, in vivo delivery, where we directly inject our genetic information in vivo into the body of the patient. And this approach is required for the large majority of cells because those cell, most um, uh, cells in the body cannot just be taken out and put back in again. For a small subset of cells, we can also devise an ex vivo, which is mostly cell-based delivery system. And here um, we especially uh, direct our attention to the blood, which is a, a strange type of tissue um, consisting of cells that we can easily take out of a patient, modify ex vivo by adding genetic information, select the corrected cells indicated here as the cells with the blue dots, and then re-inject into the patients. Uh, so the delivery route can either be directly into the tissue or cells that we want to be targeting, or in uh, some rare cases, we can take out cells of our interest, modify them ex vivo, and re-implant them uh, in the patient. Now, how, uh, how can we transfer this genetic information into cells or into tissues uh, in the body? There are different ways to do that. One of the approaches that have been uh, used are the use of plasmids or plasmids combined with liposomes, but this technology is overall quite inefficient to transfer genetic information. The most used platform is actually based on viruses or virus-based vectors, which we refer to as viral vectors. As you see here, the four viruses indicated here are the parental viruses that have been uh, used in the past few decades most frequently to transfer genetic information. And if we look at the viral vectors that are derived from these parental viruses, um, we see that they come in a very broad range of different features. Um, we have enveloped, like the lentiviral and the gamma retroviral vectors, but also non-enveloped uh, viral vectors. They differ in size. For example, the recombinant AAV-like uh, vectors are about 20 nanometer in diameter, which is about the size of a ribosome. The packaging size can differ as well. And logically, if you only have a packaging size of 4.7 KB, this will limit the amount of genetic information that can be transferred. Also important is the immunogenicity. In the end, these are viral vectors. They are based on viruses and um, our cells but also the, the human body consists also cons, um, contains an immune system, which will also, especially when high amounts of viral vector are provided to our patients, may elicit an immune response. So it's important that if we want to transfer genetic information, that we choose the best matching vector for uh, the adequate to transfer the, the payload. Now, what is very important is 
there is no such thing as an ideal or a perfect vector. In the end, for a gene therapeutic approach, we will have to trade to make trade-offs to find the best um, vector for a particular uh, application. Now, I um, indicated to you already the fact that we have viruses that we convert it into viral vectors. And in the next few slides, I will briefly explain you how a virus can be converted into a viral vector. Because it's very important that when we use viral vectors for gene therapeutic approaches, that these viruses that originally may cause disease, which is not the case in the, in, in, uh, in the case of AAV uh, or other not associated uh, viruses, but we do not want to elicit um, a disease in our patients. We just want to transfer genetic information. We want to use these viruses, these viral vectors, um, and use the specific feature of the parental virus to efficiently transfer genetic information to cells um, in the body of our patient. So what you see here is a schematic of a wild type, I don't know, associated uh, virus with an icosahedral uh, capsid consisting of protein. And in, at the inside, there is a single stranded DNA genome. This genome consists of ITRs, inverted, uh, inverted terminal repeats at either end, and wrap and cap genes. Upon transcription, um, these genes will give rise to RNAs that can be uh, translated into these different proteins. Now, what did researchers do to convert this virus into a viral vector to generate recombinant RAAV vectors? They actually split up the whole genome of this AAV virus into three different plasmids. One plasmid is the transfer plasmid. It's a plasmid that contains the information for the ITRs allowing packaging later on of this new genome. And this uh, genome is depleted from uh, depleted for the wrap and the cap uh, gene sequences. These are encoded on a second plasmid, the packaging plasmid, which will provide all functional proteins to um, regenerate a new vector particle and a third plasmid with adenovirus um, uh, proteins that are required for efficient viral vector production. And that means that in the transfer plasmid, since we now replaced the wrap and the cap gene on a second plasmid, that we have now space to clone the genetic information of our interest with a promoter driving the transgene of interest and um, a poly A tail that is um, bridging uh, to the next ITR. These three plasmids in order to produce recombinant AAV vectors are then transfected in mostly HEC293 uh, producer cells. And upon transfection, when all three plasmids are present, the transfer plasmid will give rise to the new recombinant AAV genome transcribed from ITR to ITR. The packaging plasmid will transcribe an RNA containing wrap cap, which will be translated into structural proteins, packaging the single-stranded DNA genome of the transfer uh, plasmid. And thirdly, this will all be triggered by the adenoviral helper uh, plasmid encoded uh, proteins. And that means that cells that are transfected will in the end produce recombinant RAAV, RAAV particles that can be harvested and concentrated. And these viral vectors now, they have the outside that looks like an AV virus. So they still have the efficiency to transfer cells as efficiently as the parental virus. But the genetic payload that is packaged now contains our transgene of interest. And these then can be transferred, for example, here in vivo through different routes, intravenously, intracranially, intranasally or intramuscularly into our patient, depending on the particular application. Once these viral vectors now will reach the target cell, they will recognize a receptor, be taken up through the endosomal um, uh, pathway, they will escape the endosome, enter the nucleus, a second strand synthesis will, uh, from the single-stranded DNA will be generated to form episomal DNA that will reside in the nucleus of the transduced cell. This double-stranded episomal DNA will be able to be transcribed into RNA. RNA gets exported, translated into protein, and from that moment on, these cells will produce 
the transgenic protein of interest. A similar approach, but I don't have time to go into um, to detail here in, these, in, in, in this uh, short webinar, a similar approach has been used to develop lentiviral and retroviral based factors. Now, to give you at least um, an, an, an example, um, I uh, selected here the clinical application of Luxturna. Luxturna is an, a drug that is based on uh, RAV2 um, that um, obtained market approval uh, in the USA in 2017 and in uh, 2018 um, also in Europe um, uh, through the EMA. It's a therapy that is put on the market uh, to treat retinal gene, uh, for retinal gene therapy to uh, treat liver congenital amaurosis, which is a form of con congenital blindness. It's a disease that is as having a very low prevalence, like one in 50 to 100,000 patients um, or newborns will, will suffer from this disorder. And it's put uh, on the market through Spark uh, Therapeutics. Now, how does this therapy work? The Luxturna contains RAV base vectors that encode a correct version of the RPE65 uh, gene or protein. So here it will be the cDNA is encoded in the AV. AV vectors will be injected in uh, the subretinal uh, uh, in the eye of the patient to transduce there the retinal pigment um, epithelium. Like here you see a schematic uh, cartoon showing how the neural uh, retina is uh, displaced. AV vectors are injected and it's these cells that are lacking a functional version of RPE65 that are now being provided with the functional, with a, with a, uh, with a, um, a correct copy of RPE65 cDNA, which will be trans transcribed and translated into a functional protein. So in a second step, these RAV, RAV particles will transduce the cells, second strand synthesis, circularization, and this episome will be transcribed uh, and translated into a functional protein, thereby restoring the visual cycle. It's important to know that here um, that these patients, again, um, obtain some vision, but the vision is not um, like, like for people that do not ha have suffered any um, blindness before. Now, um, in the last few sites, I would like to give some info on, on what are the challenges. Um, one of the first challenges is the substantial cost, as you might all know. Um, a lot of uh, rare disease organizations have mentioned it before. Uh, incurable disorders lacking a treatment have become, in the mean, in, in the, the past few years, curable disorders, but with treatments that are unpayable. Yeah, with treatments costing between 500,000 and 2 million euros uh, for a drug. This has been um, causing quite some uh, discussion uh, in the field. But also here, we have to, to see how gene therapy can become reality, because also we should think about novel regimens um, to pay for gene therapy. And it's as, as Goldman Sachs analysis, analysts have put it, curing patients is indeed bad for business in the long run. And we should we should consider other models. For example, instead of paying upfront for a medicine for which we actually do not know how long it's going to last, we might also consider paying for future success um, regimens, for example. And still, it's also important to realize, and that's what's shown in this table, that um, gene therapies are indeed very expensive. But this table just indicates for these uh, diseases, what is the overall uh, lifetime uh, treatment costs for patients suffering for, from this um, disease, which, which it's not an argument, but which may uh, show that indeed these kind of treatments, they're, it's very early days, but that in the end, it's still cheaper to treat patients with a gene therapy than to um, cover just a, a, a lifetime uh, treatment costs. Now, what is a main problem in gene therapy and bottleneck is the production. Gene therapy, um, the market and the production really needs um, 
to get a huge boost. First of all, because we currently have 19 products on the market, but the number of indications um, that is trying to be tackled by gene therapeutic approaches is rising. Yeah, as indicated earlier, we have about 1900 in the pipeline. Secondly, um, up till now, indications that were treated were very, very rare, um, whereas now also indications that are more frequent are being tackled. Thirdly, we, instead of only targeting the eye, as was the case for Luxturna, only needing about 10 to the 11th vector genomes to be injected. We now also try to tackle systemic disorders where the whole body has to be treated, such as, for example, the muscle in the muscular dystrophy, where we need about 10,000 fold more viral vectors um, for, to treat um, a patient. And thirdly, Initially, pediatric disorders were tackled, but um, the field is also shifting and aims to treat adult patients. And obviously, um, adults are much larger, much much um, taller, which will again uh, require the field to produce much more viral vector particles. So, in conclusion, um, gene therapy plug and play is very hard uh, to realize for single gene disorders. The effects can be dramatic and life-changing for the patients. We have more than 1,850 treatments in the pipeline, of which several in phase three, which will emerge in the next few years. It's important to realize that ATMPs and gene therapies in, in uh, particular are a novel class of therapeutics um, that we have to learn and translate the learnings from animal models to human. It's very challenging. We have to get to know the unknowns. We still have to understand the effect of restoration um, of the pathophysiology. It's not just adding a gene and that everything goes well. It's the first time that we do this. Secondly, um, the effect of manufacturing impurities and systemic toxicity is something to be tackled. And regulatory science must mature as well. How do we assess safety and purity and potency clinical efficacy of uh, these drug products. Yeah. And in parallel, we have to prepare regulators. We have to prepare healthcare institutions to train people to use these um, uh, novel medicines. We also have to prepare the general uh, public. And for most, we have to prepare manufacturing because manufacturing ideally should be robust, reproducible and high yielding in a closed system, but we're not there yet. The manufacturing challenges or the main challenges uh, that I would define is that uh, it's a biological process to produce viral vectors that is still incompletely uh, understood. There is a need for better analytical assess to assess the quality and the potency of the viral vectors that are being produced. We should um, be better controlling the impurities that might contaminate our viral vector production, as exemplified here by only the full capsids for AV will be the functional ones. And all these impurities we have to uh, get rid of. And thirdly, um, we need more, more, more. So manufacturing will need to scale out um, and scale up. And with that, I would like to uh, round up and uh, give the work to uh, Jan. So I'm Jan Schroten. I'm I'm an engineer uh, by training. So uh, based on my background, I would like to put or discuss with you or give you some flavors about how technological innovation can uh, help create or let's say make the potential of of cell and gene therapy or ATMPs in general sustainable. So as uh, Rick already mentioned, it has a huge potential. Uh, it's biologically very complex uh, and manufacturing is one of the bottlenecks as part of the bigger complexity of also economics, bringing it to the patient regulation. But I want to use my slot here to uh, explain to you how we could with technologies that are available, um, support the translation of uh, ATMP, the, the promise into a reality. 
So, so who are we? Um, Antleron, it's a, an R&D company in Leuven. It started from uh, a group of people uh, amongst myself who've been in research in ATMP since the 90s. And uh, we're seeing the potential of, of this biological know-how, as also Rick explained, from an academic, from a research site, but also saw the big gap in bringing it uh, to patients. Uh, we tried a long time from that side, but then let's say um, quit our jobs and uh, set up this company to bridge uh, the gap between the biological potential um, and the huge promise and seeing what technologies are out there that we could leverage to bring them closer and faster to patients in a sustainable way. So we as, as a company, as a team, believe that the one therapy fits all um, is can change and that people can get a personalized therapy, can be a one-on-one, -on -one, but could also be in another range. And that we could bring advanced therapies to patients by combining it with technological know-how. But the key thing is, as, as Rick mentioned, you have to do this end-to-end. -end. Uh, it doesn't make sense to focus on one part of the process and then hoping that all things before or after or up or downstream uh, get solved. And why is now the time to, to do this? I think it's uh, something you see um, throughout industry and, and also in daily life, the 4.0, uh, call it the digital, but it's also using data. So we can generate a lot of data at different levels and we can do a lot with it. So it's the, the power of data, it's patient data. It can be data during manufacturing. It can be data uh, from uh, the end user the physician in this field, but you need to integrate it and connect all this uh, information you can get in an intelligent way also to the manufacturing process, to the supply chain. So it's the same as we, we say the factories of the future, the industry 4.0. It's also something that's becoming a reality in, in this complex uh, biological field where basically you have to create living medicines. Uh, that's another thing that was mentioned. Here we are dealing with uh, biology. It, it's alive. Uh, it has its own will. Uh, there are differences across patients, across sources. So you need to tackle this uh, varying or let's say less robust or consistent raw material as we are used to dealing with in this field. Uh, is this impossible? No, but you need other methods to, to address this. If you do a copy paste on how we uh, produced uh, medicines in the past or, or basically have uh, black and white chemistry, yes or no, this uh, copy paste will not be sustainable in this field. You need other ways to do this. Um, if you would generally uh, on the higher level, not only for, for gene therapy, but ATMPs uh, in general, what you see a lot is schematics like these that uh, you start from uh, patient own material or patient information. Uh, you start also from cell sources that you use uh, in your process. For example, as was mentioned, uh, the hex cells uh, to, uh, as producer cells. You could also use cells as part of the end therapy, but you need to do a lot of handlings on these cells. You need to select, culture them. Uh, you need to scale it up, as was mentioned, and then either combine them with something else in an individualized way or in let's say a larger scale. And then you have to also bring it back uh, to the clinic, to the patient. Uh, can you store it? Can you store it long-term because it's alive? Do you need to do it on the spot? If it's uh, on the spot, how do you do a quality control? Uh, because in standard, it's, it's time is taken for quality controls and I'll come back to that. So you have to close the whole loop. So all the different steps, uh, we have information or we have technology, but we need to integrate it. And what I also put centrally is uh, it's a computer screen, but it's data. Using data at the different levels and trying to uh, make the blueprint for the factory, call it the factory of the future, but also then make it sustainable and scalable. So cost is also very important. So if we see this transition uh, from the traditional uh, one size fits all, you make one composition for a, a, a very broad patient group, 
that you need either to to stratify because you have differences in patients. Also, as was mentioned, do you treat uh, a young patient versus an adult with a similar dose? On what is it based? Uh, how does that implement your manufacturing, your quality? Uh, also, let's say the potency of, of your product. And you can also push it through the whole way to, okay, at the end, uh, are we best served by uh, an individualized uh, treatment? Do we have, let's say, at the end, everybody its own factory? Maybe technically it's possible, but also from an economical, as was mentioned, the health economics, what's, let's say, the cost versus the value or the added value of the therapy? Or is it something in between? So if we see that and, and look at it, how uh, viral vector manufacturing uh, is done. So this is a, a standard schematic uh, plasmid development and production. Then basically you have your cells as a, as a working horse uh, that you need to combine and then uh, the transfection. And then you have your viral vector production as was mentioned. So call it the upstream, but then you have to have, get your final product being the viral vectors, getting it out. Uh, and then also formulate, fill, package, finish, store, and bring it back. So it's a long, complex process where it's biology throughout that basically at the end, uh, it needs to be an integrated approach. Today, I will focus uh, mainly on the upstream, uh, on the cell expansion, but the principles uh, that are mentioned there also apply to other steps. But I just want to give you a flavor uh, what are we dealing with and uh, what kind of technological solutions are out there uh, that we can start using or that are being used. And basically, if you look at uh, from, it's the same story again. So on, on the left, uh, it was mentioned also earlier uh, by Rick, uh, we see a lot of clinical trials. If we would imagine then based on, let's say, a success rate of these clinical trials, we have to start manufacturing and bringing these therapies, cell and gene to patients. Uh, basically, uh, in the coming years, and you can uh, push it further, the graph, we don't have enough capacities. Basically, there are not enough factories or capacity uh, spread out over the world to manufacture these. Um, and it has to do with different things. It's uh, related to how we uh, do this manufacturing. And also on the right, you see some examples on what, let's say, time scales we're talking about. Uh, it also differs a lot. So it's not that there's an ideal process or an ideal combination. It, it differs from product to product or also from manufacturer to manufacturer. So it's a lot of different steps uh, that take a long time with a lot of risks uh, uh, during your process. And how they are done influences a lot uh, how we can, let's say, service the market or the need for these therapies. But even if these would work and they would be affordable, we still can't make enough. Um, a simple example, it's the same as in vaccines. If uh, the World Health Organization, it's yearly request for vaccines for the, the third world or worldwide can't be supplied by all the companies. So, And that is because the way it's manufactured, the additional investments, there's no return on that. So companies won't, can't produce more and uh, build a viable business model on that. And it also counts here. If you see, you could, let's say, maybe technically uh, do it or make up the factories. If you do innovation, another thing is the cost or the price. So that's also something that needs to be addressed. Uh, is this a big issue? Uh, yes, it was mentioned before and also see, and I think this is a, a recent report by, by McKinsey showing also there's, let's say, a big interest if these guys make a report on that. Uh, and there are some challenges and uh, you see the challenges here. So, uh, sorry, manufacturing uh, is a lot. And as mentioned, uh, there's uh, not one ideal solution. Um, we have to see uh, how upstream, downstream influences each other. Also, all the know-how to do this, it's not, let's say, internalized, integrated within one company. So you need collaborations with, uh, let's say, across the life cycle of the product or end-to-end -end, biologists, with physicians, with engineers, with technicians, with data people. So it also requires a lot of, uh, let's say, novel or innovative ways of, of collaboration. And basically what needs to be done is 
select or develop manufacturing platforms. Also see where do you put your money? Do you, uh, I want to make a, a football field of clean rooms? Do I focus on a bioreactor uh, that makes a difference? I'll show you some cases and also do it end to end. And then again, as mentioned here, uh, capitalize uh, or use the digital power and, and implement it. But these are, let's say, a lot of disruptive steps uh, for uh, the, making it into an industry or for companies that have that come from, call it classical medicines and have to take the step. And the other way from small companies building up manufacturing capacity, it's a, it's a huge investment and it's a, let's say, a critical decision that affects long term. So very important to take the right decision. And then here, and I will sh focus a little bit on that. Eh? So basically all the steps from procurement and the upstream processing, then the downstream, and then uh, fill and finish and quality. And quality can also shift into the process. Uh, but uh, the slides I, that will follow, I'll, I'll focus on the upstream. So actual the cell manufacturing itself uh, as being one of the critical steps as part of this manufacturing process, as an example. Um, if you go through literature, and these are just, if you uh, type in Google, let's say, uh, process challenges, critical things, you find a lot of, of publications uh, and more and more, uh, meaning that uh, it's a point of attention that people are looking for solutions uh, and that they are coming, but that they see it uh, to make it happen. We really need to um, make it happen. And the good thing is that in most of these publications, it's always a combination of uh, biology, uh, data, and technology, a combination of, of making solutions and making it happen. So that's a good way that, it, that it's happening. And it's both on an academic level, but also a lot of these publications come from companies. So they also share their issues, their bottlenecks, their progress, uh, maybe on a more generic level, uh, but it's good that it's coming from both sides and we can learn and that way progress. So I would advise uh, if you want to dig in deep, just uh, search for some of these uh, publications and get a feeling of how the combination of technology and biology is moving forward. So some of these tools that I will give you a flavor of and, and that are coming, uh, they, they exist already in other fields. It's the principle of quality by design comes from the food industry, but it's also, let's say, a, a strategy of uh, product and process developments that used in other industries a lot. It's finding its way now uh, to this field. Uh, process analytical technology, uh, as you shown on the right. Uh, so uh, you need to understand your process, which was mentioned earlier, is still critical here because we don't know everything yet from the biology. So we have to find a strategy and that's why quality by design can help if we don't know everything to do it risk-based and get all your risks under control. Then during your process, get as much data as possible and then make your process more intensified or more efficient uh, to get, let's say, better yields and to allow scalability, but then also to be able to do uh, quality control and that you need to fully integrate. And process analytical technology in the chemical industry or other industries, it's uh, commonly used. But that means, let's say, there's know-how, there's technology, but we need to, let's say, uh, use the generics and customize it to this field. And another thing is uh, that's coming that uh, with AI or machine learning is possible. It's using, let's say, uh, sensor data or information you can get from an analytical equipment and combining it uh, with machine learning or uh, AI algorithms to make it more intelligent. And in the AI, you want to put in the biological know-how and that way getting more information out of your data. So it's a lot of technological tools that are out there, but we need to combine them and bring them into this field and show that they are an added value. And this slide, it comes from one of these papers. Uh, so basically what you see on the top two rows is a lot of uh, analytical techniques that are used in this field to assess quality and to use them either in development, but most likely also uh, in manufacturing. But if you have to scale these and keep them constantly doing during manufacturing, you have a very complex and lengthy process and a very expensive one. So uh, at the bottom you can see, and it's on the right, it's mentioned if we uh, could 
use soft sensors that could also be helpful in real time monitoring and doing it indirectly also not uh, harming or uh, sacrificing our actual product to do quality control and that can be both applied in the upstream and the downstream so you see this shift it's not something you do at the end it should be an integrated part of your manufacturing solution. So understanding your biology as good as you can and translating it into a sustainable and scalable way of getting data in and out of your process. Um, and now I want to, to say these tools, why do we need them? And this is uh, a publication on, on a dendritic cell vaccine. Uh, the manufacturing of those. So these cells are also used and loaded with antigens or other uh, biologics to be used as a therapy. And people uh, need to produce the cells and then combine them. And they're looking at different options like a standard way of an open process in cell culture plastic versus closing the process and things like that. But from this publication, and it applies to, to also other cell therapies, here, for example, the limit, and you see it, is around 50,000 K for the cost side. Uh, the combination of the manufacturing, the labor, uh, the quality control you need to do. And it seems to be with existing technologies, you can't go lower. And you also see the top end that based on the classic way, if you do it um, in a very open way, it's, it's much more expensive. But the lower limit seems to be, let's say, a glass ceiling, uh, to put it that way that without innovations, we can't push it lower. And this is from the cost side. Eh? So the numbers you heard earlier, that's from uh, the price side to the outside. But it means that intrinsically they are, let's say also expensive to make. It also relates to the scale uh, we're making them. And let's say to the manual labor and the quality control that's related to them. Um, but you also see, and this is uh, at the bottom at, we can reduce this factor by uh, factors of, of 2 to 10. And this is also from publications and from data. And how can we do that? By developing them faster using data or other ways of development by intensifying the process so that we reduce the footprint of the factories, make it more efficient using soft sensing or digital twins. So these digital tools uh, shifting over to in process uh, quality control and very importantly, also scaling strategies. And why do we need scaling strategies? And that's uh, an old paper uh, that you see on the left, this graph, it's from 2013, but it's still uh, very relevant. So here you see a graph, like if we would uh, need to produce cells at large scales uh, for gene or cell therapy, uh, if we come to the really large numbers that we would need if we do it for wider applications or to scale up uh, or to service a full market, basically the, the technologies are not there yet. Uh, so that's, that's a limit. Uh, there is progress, but it's still not that we have, let's say, the factories or the bioreactors or whatever available to do it uh, or to buy them and to get going. Um, so that's something that needs to uh, align with the needs of, of manufacturing. And as I said before, there is no ideal solution. So it's not that you can go through a catalog, buy a bioreactor or uh, an equipment and you get going. And it all has to do with what's shown in the middle that a lot of the things we do, uh, it's 2D biology where we can't monitor and enough or a lot so we can't control so we have limited robustness and we do that need to do then uh, before release or after the manufacturing a lot of uh, assessments before we can release the product so if we put biology in a more closed systems we have some better control can monitor something more and increase the robustness but here graphically i wanted to show that if we don't fully control this closed system or don't get information out uh, it's still limited. So what we need to do is to make uh, very controllable and consistent closed systems, and that way get a robust product out and also can monitor and control a lot during the process. And that way we can improve efficiency, quality, and reduce costs, and then make the dream of uh, cell and gene therapy becoming a, a reality. So basically what is happening and what you see a lot is that a lot of research is done uh, in 2D, so static conditions, uh, well plates, a lot of findings are done there. But if you want to scale up, 
uh, or you need to manufacture the numbers you need. If you do that, uh, let's say plastic-based uh, manufacturing, you need basically big football fields of clean rooms. Uh, that's not sustainable. That limits the same as with a lot of vaccines where they re- use roller bottles. There are limitations. Shifting cells into a dynamic environment or a three-dimension and a four-dimension with, with mass transport, uh, it's not a copy-paste. Uh, biology uh, has its limitations or you need to adjust or train it or uh, um, let's make it custom to these environments. But then also you need to be able to scale. So maybe it works in uh, 500 milliliter a liter, but basically a lot of people need thousands of liters. So this upstream process of uh, making it scalable and make it robust with sufficient yield, uh, it's it's very important. So one step is, is to bring cells in that environment and then also make it scalable and sustainable. So basically what needs to happen is what we see on the left, that's still happening a lot. Uh, also for some of the gene therapies, it's basically a craft where uh, highly skilled people who do cell culture and then also do transfections and other steps. Basically, ideally, you want to go to the right where you have skilled people who know the process and the biology in a control room and basically data coming in and out of of a real factory. So that also allows you to go from craft to industry. Um, And here, and I mentioned some names of companies or that you know from other fields that are now also active in this field. For example, Siemens, uh, they, they know how to build factories uh, in different industries. So they are also close to this industry because they could translate, let's say, uh, proof of concepts or uh, a blueprint of uh, handlings into a closed process. But what's important here is that you need to know how to bring an idea to manufacturing, how to bring it to the market, quality and regulations, efficiency, costs, and then flexibility where you want to go. You basically need to know all these, let's say, ingredients from the start and define them because they define how your also development will look like, but then also your manufacturing. And it's not something you do step by step. It's an integrated approach. So you have to look end to end. And that's in this field still difficult because we don't know everything. So a risk-based approach to do that could also be very helpful. Another thing, and you see it a lot, uh, call it the avatars or other thing. The virtual reality also helps here. So you have here, this is a a company in Belgium that basically uh, in the virtual world can design a factory and you could also do training there or simulations before you actually start building or things like that. So it saves time. uh, It helps you to make decisions and it could also generate data that could be helpful afterwards and then also make a digital twin. So this is one example of of the power of of virtual reality and using it in this field. Then you could say, okay, uh, if if my biology works and I've shown proof of concept on a small scale, uh, maybe factories look like this. And this is something that, for example, the Fraunhofer Institute in Germany is doing. But this is what you see here. It's automating a, a manual process. It's still a 2D biology, but basically you take out all let's say the operator uh, handlings that way, trying to make it more robust, consistent. So this is uh, one step that's that's ongoing. And there we seem to see, okay, how far does it scale? Is there an added value uh, towards quality? And is it cost-wise also scalable? But these are routes that are followed. Another thing what you see uh, happening, and that comes back what I showed you before, the process consists of a lot of steps. There is basically a lot of hardware out there commercially available uh, that's being used for a long time or or very innovative to enable a closed process. And basically, if you can connect some or all of these, you basically could make your end-to-end process. Uh, But it's not if you by connecting them all that it will work. So you still have to customize them. And that means uh, changing things uh, on equipments, uh, getting more data in and out, decision-making. It's not always easy. These machines don't always talk to each other. But it also means that you don't, if you want to say, I need to develop my custom process, that you have to start from scratch. So uh, there's a lot of equipment available that's also already been used uh, in the clinic or uh, on the GMP. Uh, so that allows you to use them uh, very fast. But the key thing is, 
it's easier to adjust the equipment to your biology than to try to squeeze your biology and play with it in a standard equipment. So that's also a mindset that you need to have. And then again, here, uh, process analytical technology, it's something, uh, and here the schematic is that it's a standard schematic that's also used in uh, chemical industries or, or elsewhere, but it's your bioreactor. Uh, you need to get information in and out and connect it to a lot of uh, decision making, uh, to quality, and that way uh, make your process robust and more scalable. This is a principle and that needs to be implemented. And in this field also very importantly, it needs to meet regulation. So also it's not a copy paste from other industries. This is a regulated uh, environment. So we need to see what kind of elements can be used and how to they need to be adjusted. But these principles work. Another thing, as mentioned before, eh, it's biology, it's variable. You're dealing with a lot of parameters. You're a complex process. We don't know everything. Uh, so how could we, let's say, move forward? And uh, this is a paper that's uh, it's called Quality uh, Cell Therapy Manufacturing by Design. So it basically explains the principle of uh, risk-based process development or quality by design that's been used in other industries for a long time, how it could be a strategic solution to do product and process development in this field and allows you to go from a proof of concept in a lab to a large scale, to select the best bioreactor, to also see how to culture your cell best and get information in and out. The good thing of quality by design as a development or let's say a strategic route uh, for process and product development in this field is that it is accepted and there's guidance on, let's say, both from both FDA and EMA to use it as a principle or a way forward. So that also allows you to use it in this field as a way forward. And here it's from the same publication. I, I just took it out. So basically, uh, you need to iterate between uh, what you can, what you want to identify, or the identity, the purity, the potency of your product, and see if you can measure it. How can I make it better? Can I reduce risk? And that way, go around. But I would advise to read this paper or some similar ones to get a better feel of this. Uh, is it something that's blue sky? No. And uh, here, and you can also see from the slide, uh, quality by design is already used it's 10 years ago now by the big players uh, in vaccine manufacturing uh, because they saw that, let's say, the old way of making vaccines and also other types of, of vaccines has its limitations. So they were also looking of novel strategies to enable next generation manufacturing. And basically their conclusions was that using quality by design allows them to better understand their product and process. So very key, make it more robust and consistent, and then also uh, make it more cost effective in that way. So the topics that came in, in Rick's presentation and in mine uh, here are, let's say, uh, addressed or investigated by the big players in, in this field. So. This is also a good sign that these, these principles that are mentioned in literature are, let's say, adopted more and more in this field. Uh, they're, they're very mature in other fields, but it, it's very helpful to do that. And you see also it's uh, from the CMC working group, so it's not the people in the R&D lab. It's really the people that are related to actual manufacturing of uh, these products. If we come back then, uh, we had uh, using a robot as a solution. Uh, could it be that basically you have your individual factory? So here, or let's say a more customized or intensified factory, call it a GMP in a box, can be personalized or not. Here you have two examples of existing technologies that are used in cell and gene therapy that are actually available. And uh, the left one is already used uh, for clinical manufacturing, the right one is, is close to that or the next generation of it. And the right one also, it's a, it's a Belgian company. And the nice thing also, you see it works with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And that comes back to the need, uh, the worldwide need to uh, supply, let's say, third world countries and other with next generation vaccines at an affordable cost. So you see also that these philanthropic people are interested in next generation manufacturing to, let's say, bring these therapies uh, to the worldwide population. And basically here you see the principle, what, what they say, and this is an, an older slide. So if you would visit 
their their websites or their publications, you can see much more actual data and cases where they're using it in the cell and gene therapy field. So basically, if you see on the left, the traditional factory uh, is very big, 10,000 square meters, and it costs a lot, 200 million euros. If you have now, a, let's say, a manufacturing that's very, very much intensified, so the output of cells per volume is much higher, you need a smaller factory and also you need less investment so this makes uh, let's say taking the step of setting up new factories that have the same output as the conventional ones make it let's say uh, more realistic for new companies or for companies to uh, build additional sites or uh, let's say implement novel ways of, of manufacturing then you can think one step further if you say uh, we also have nanotechnology, chip technology that also uh, is very powerful. Uh, it can, biology at different scales also fits with this technology. It allows you to put data in, get data out. Uh, it scales uh, very easily if you see how many chips we need on a daily basis. So could we make small intelligent factories uh, by using this? So this is an example of of IMAC in, in Belgium, where they are also using their technology and combining it uh, with biology, not only to get information from biology and scale it, but also thinking of, let's say, uh, customized bioreactors, the same as I showed you for the Lonza case, and, and then linking it up. And they're also connecting to the field of, of cell and gene therapy. So there you see another mix of uh, established technologies that are very powerful, but you need to connect them up to the field uh, and that way see where the added value or the crossover is. But it's happening. And then here to come close, uh, as I mentioned earlier, you also have uh, machine learning or AI. And basically what you want to show is at the, the top is what is happening a lot. You have closed systems, bioreactors or other process steps where you put uh, cells or other biological material in and you get... Uh, more out or a changed product out, but you want to have that more consistently. So you need a consistent bioreactor, but also get information in and out. And ideally do that real time, non-invasively, that you don't need to sacrifice your product and that you can move uh, fast forward, uh, bringing it to the patient. And this is an example of, for example, uh, a, a novel imaging technology that uses also AI. So it gives a three-dimensional image of a cell or another uh, biological product, but mainly cells. But it doesn't only give information about the cell size or the contours, but can also give you uh, information on surface markers or other things. And it can also be trained if you know a lot of your biology that, for example, by biochemical analysis you have established. You can train also um, here the algorithm to recognize cells. And for example, also something that Rick mentioned, okay, what's the quality do? Is the transfection okay or things like that? And you can do that non-invasively um, during the manufacturing. So here you see another example of uh, interesting tools that are there, but they need to be integrated and could then help uh, becoming part of cell manufacturing as part of, of a gene therapy or a cell therapy. So to conclude, and then maybe if, if we all uh, put our heads together, uh, it can be that at the end we get our own uh, personal factory and are, let's say, sustainably helpful uh, in, in, an, in a happy world. So it's a lot of positive things. But if you see technology and the power of biology, we could move in that direction. So meaning that your cells, your data, your design could deliver your therapy. Um, but the key thing is, we can't do that alone. So we need to all put our heads and minds together and, and do it combinedly. Thank you. Thanks a lot, uh, Jan, for this uh, very interesting talk. And also thanks a lot, uh, Rick, for um, your very interesting uh, presentation. Um, Welcome. I am here wondering because we are a little bit uh, over time already um, and normally we would have uh, some time for some questions. What we also said that is that we would in any case um, welcome any questions that we can afterwards as, uh, as well share with, uh, with the audience. I will share also with you when we have our next webinars, which is actually 
the one organized Beatrice and Ema uh, on the support of academic and nonprofit uh, ATMP developers, the 1st of December, where Patrick Selis from the European Medicines Agency will speak to you. And then we have a last webinar on the market access of uh, ATMPs on the 20th of December, which will be organized by myself, but also by Francis Ariks. Uh, from our payer, from the Belgian payer, and we will zoom in more into how to bring in these from a um, uh, financial point of view, these ATMPs to the market. I actually, we, I don't think that we have any minutes left for another question. I think that uh, Professor Gijs has already uh, uh, answered a lot of questions here in the chat I have seen. Um, and um, but yeah, I try to answer most of the questions. But yeah, if if people still have issues or uh, I think they can drop them through and you, and then we will try to get back to them. Voila. So if any people, uh, if any persons have questions related to the webinar, please uh, send them to me and then I will forward them to the to the speakers and we are very happy to, um, to answer them for you. So thanks a lot everyone for this uh, webinar, for listening here and also thanks a lot for the speakers for this webinar. Also thanks a lot to um, Beatrice uh, for the really advanced project. Uh, for making this possible. I hope that everyone has learned a lot and I'm sure that this this uh, afternoon. So have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you.